Afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the latest in our series of programs, virtual programs from Cooperstown, New York, site of the National Baseball Hall of Fame and Museum. We're absolutely thrilled today to present Virtual Legends of the Game, uh, the first in a series of talks with Hall of Famers coming up over the next couple of weeks. Today, we're very glad to have with us a member of the Hall's class of 2018. He played 22 years in the major leagues, hit 612 home runs, an incredibly patient hitter, drew over 1,700 walks, nine times had over 100 walks in a season. That shows how disciplined he was. And also very impressively, nine times uh, he received votes in the Most Valuable Player Award balloting. Joining us from the Hall of Fame's class of 2018, Jim Tomey. Jim, how are you doing? I'm doing great, guys. How are you? We're doing very well. You've been uh, okay during this health crisis over these last three to four months? We have. We've, uh, we've you know, followed the guidelines here in Illinois. We live in Chicago, so... You know, just uh, just waiting to hopefully get back to some normalcy here and uh, and get things back to normal. We're uh, I know this has been since March. You know, leaving spring training, coming home for me personally, it's given me uh, an opportunity to spend a lot of time with my family. Which honestly, for 22 some years, 23 years, I've always been on the go and. Uh, it's just, it's been very, it's been refreshing from the family and to spend a lot of time together. And, and hopefully, hopefully we can keep seeing the numbers go down so we can get back to that normal state that I think everybody wants to be. Jim, before we address and discuss your career, we do want to address another important issue. The yeah. ongoing racial protests, the civil unrest across the country. On Thursday, the Hall of Fame provided uh, the language uh, at our website that um, kind of reemphasized uh, what we are trying to do in terms of our mission. Uh, for many years, we have offered programs in the areas of civil rights, cultural diversity. Obviously, we're going to continue to do that, but we're also going to uh, accelerate efforts in some other related areas. So let me read from the Hall of Fame language on our website. The National Baseball Hall of Fame and Museum believes it is critical that conversations about social injustice and inequality continue within our society and beyond. In strengthening our commitment, we have launched a comprehensive educational resource that will further elevate the history of baseball and civil rights in America. As a cultural and educational institution, we remain committed to sharing the reality of racial inequality and its history within America's pastime. So that is part of our uh, language that we issued yesterday. Also at our website, we have a new educational resource webpage about baseball and civil rights. And when our program is done today, we certainly encourage everybody to go to the homepage. You'll see the link to that educational resource. This is something very important to us, obviously. Now, Jim, you and your wife, Andrea, you've been preparing a response to this yeah. issue in recent weeks. Tell us your thoughts on this situation. So, so for us, and thanks again, Bruce, uh, you know, for me, having, and, and Andrea as well, she was a part of it, you know, so having grown up in baseball in, in minor league and major league clubhouses uh, with so many people from different backgrounds, uh, that became great teammates and friends. That to me was one of the greatest gifts personally that I feel that I took away from baseball. Uh, look, I'll never know what it's like to be a black person in America. So I'm going to listen and be a part of the solution going forward. Uh, what happened to George Floyd and so many others before him was 100% wrong. And I know Andrea and our family, we fully support the Black Lives Matters movement and hope it will ultimately lead to long overdue healing. You know, I think it's very important. I think we're, we need to start educating ourselves. And, and I think this is like the first steps to doing that. So, you know, thanks for bringing that up. And, uh, you know, I know moving forward, I know we always 
kind of talk about just kindness and just treating people well. And I feel like baseball has given me that. It's given me great friends of different cultures. And, uh, you know, it's something very important to us. Well said, Jim. Uh, let's delve into your career. It's been a fascinating career. You grew up in Illinois. You were a Chicago Cubs fan, is my understanding. And you had a very definite baseball hero. Might surprise some people who it is, but tell us who that hero was for you in your formative years. So for me, you know, okay, growing up in the Midwest, WGN was on TV. And coming home from high school, grade school, you know, I watched that Cubs team in the 80s. And obviously, Dave Kingman was a guy that hit a lot of long home runs. You know, I think the talk was always in our house, hey, did Kingman hit a homer today? And, and how far did it go? And, you know, I, just having that relationship, WGN, you know, kind of, kind of helped me love the game because not only did I love Kingman and the Cub players, but when teams would come in, I would then take a buddy, a couple guys, we'd go and we'd play, we called it wall ball, and you were either the Cubs or the Pirates, you were the Cubs or the Phillies, or the Cubs or the Cardinals. And that's kind of how we learned the game. We learned it from getting outside, practicing, uh, and just kind of, you know, just Matt trying to trying to just have fun as a kid playing the game that we love. And, you know, and, and WGN did that for, for a lot of the kids in the Midwest. And I'm sure that you absolutely loved these blue road pinstripes that come through. <laughs> that yeah, they, yeah, hey, any, any major league uniform is great, and those specifically stand out for sure. Now, I've read a story, and I want you to confirm whether it's true or not. But the story is that when you were very young, I'm going to guess under eight or seven years of age, you apparently somehow crawled into the Cubs dugout because you wanted to get closer to Dave Kingman. And then one of the Cubs catchers, Barry Foote, who probably weighed yeah. about 250 pounds at the time, apparently uh, very gently lifted you up and brought you out of the dugout. Yeah. Is that true? Well, yeah, I was so young, and I'm going off the stories that my dad told me. So he, we had gotten to the ballpark early. They were getting ready to start batting practice or begin batting practice. I was a huge Kingman fan. Kingman had walked by. I, we were right by the dugout. I jumped over, tried to, tried to go, I guess, ask him. Never really got to him. That's when Bear, Mr. Barry Foot, you know, took me and brought me back out. My father was right there. So it, was a, it wasn't a, hey, I'm going to chase you, you know, to a degree of across the field or anything like that. It was just you know, not really knowing. I was just a young kid that wanted an autograph and, and kind of was determined to, to get it. And it's kind of a cool story now, looking back all these years, having played 22 years or getting that chance to play a long time, uh, was just a, it's kind of a funny, great story. And it's, it shows you how sometimes determined kids are to get an autograph and, and try to remember how important young kids are to our game, how special it is. As I said, Foot was an enormous guy. He might have been pound for pound the biggest guy in the Cubs yeah. roster at the time. You ever have a chance to meet him in later years? You know, I haven't, and I would love to, actually. Uh, you know, it, it, would be, it would be cool to just kind of – see if he remembered it or whatever, you know, I'm sure he had so many, so many things going through his mind as a player. And, you know, again, it's, it's just kind of a cool story. And I'll always remember that interaction of just going to Wrigley Field and, and then, then the dream of chasing your favorite player and trying to get that, get that autograph. As an amateur player, you actually were a shortstop, then later moved to third base. Uh, here you are, very young, circa 1991. Yep. You don't look that much different, but, you know, it is around 30 years ago. Oh, yeah. Uh, you've just come up with the Cleveland Indians at the time. Let's talk about your first game. It was 1991. I believe the Minnesota Twins were the opposition. You did well that day, but tell us your specific remembrances about your Major League debut. 
it, it, it was a dream, you know, it was so quick. It was so that day, you know, getting the call and then going to Minnesota and getting there, you know, you're, you're just, it's a dream come true. And then all the work that you put in, in the minor leagues. And then obviously they, they felt highly of me to call me up. I was fortunate to get two hits that day. It was on turf and, uh, yeah, I mean, it's it, everybody kind of remembers their first day and the emotions. I remember my family, my mom and dad coming. I think three of my brothers and sisters uh, came and shared it as well. And, you know, it's something you never forget. It's like, you know, yesterday the draft just happened the mm -hmm. last couple of days and you see these kids, how excited they are to get that opportunity to start their journey. and. I was fortunate to accomplish that journey and get to the big leagues. And it's just, it's a moment that no one will ever forget. Uh, it, it was a long time ago, but it sure, it was sure something that was special for me and I know our family. You mentioned you got two hits and four at bats. Now I looked up who the pitcher was for the twins that started. Yep. You remember who it was? Tom Edens. Okay. It was Tom Edens, yep. And then I think the second one I do believe was off David was off David West. Yes. Uh, yep. Yep. I think West started the game. And oh, West started it. Game. Okay. Yeah. It was it was those two guys, and uh, you know, just again, you know, you you go through that, you go through that grind in Triple A, and when you get that call and you get there, it's just so special. Jim, let's talk about your managers, both in the minor leagues and in the major leagues. I don't want to ask you necessarily to name your favorite manager, but if there was a manager who really was the most influential, the, the guy that really helped your career yeah. and did so much for you, who would that man be? Uh, I would say hands down Charlie Manuel. Charlie, to me, was my guy. Charlie, I had him in Cleveland as a hitting instructor. He He really – uh really helped me at the lower level and and i mean countless countless hours in the cage and the ups and downs the roller coaster ride that you go through as a player and as a hitter and then getting an opportunity then he was so he was our hitting guy then getting an opportunity to play for him as a manager you know he carried that positivity that he taught us all going into the box and being confident, then as a manager instilled that, try to try to talk about that with us as players as well. And it, it uh, I don't know, he's like, he's a friend. He's like a father figure. You know, he was a guy that, that got on you and motivated you and wanted you to do well. And, you know, and I, I feel lucky. I mean, I played for Mike Hargrove. I played for Larry Boa, Ozzie Guillen, uh, Joe Torrey. You know, the great Joe Torrey in L.A. I was there for a short time. Ron Gardenhire, who is one of the one of the best baseball men as far as baseball goes. And then the great mind of Buck Showalter. So I I got to tell you, I, I was so lucky to be around some great baseball managers. And as I got older, you know, because I was a D.H. and a pinch hitter when I went late back to Philadelphia to pinch hit, uh, I really studied how those managers went about their game and, and just, you know, just tried to learn little things from them. As I recall, Charlie was a left-handed hitter, a slugger. Uh, he played mostly in the minor leagues, but he did have some cups of coffee in the majors back in the 1970s. The fact that he was a similar player to you, left-hand hitter, slugger, yeah. did that help at all? I think so. I think he could relate to where – he stood in the batter's box to what we had talked about, you know, how our journey, how our kind of experience took off, you know, like, and I, you know, and I talk about this with my son, like, you got to start from the ground up, you know, you go from your feet, you go to your knees, you go to your hands, and then you go to, you know, where you're standing in the box, and then you go to your strength. That's what Charlie did so well is he may not talk to me like he did Vizquel or Bayerga, 
you know, that's, you know, one of our greatest sayings were know thyself. And as a manager coach, coach, you have to know each player and understand the strengths that they have and then try to put that into their game and, and make them a great player. That's where he was so great. He, he knew how to, to work with each guy's strengths and also try to help, you know, improve their weaknesses. You mentioned a couple of the other managers that really helped you. Uh, I want to talk about two in particular. Larry Boa, known as uh, hard-nosed, very much old school, but has done tremendous work as a coach. Uh, he was one of the guys that really helped Robinson Cano make the adjustment to the major leagues and uh, helped develop him into a star. Um, a, a tough guy, as I said, very much old school, but he was a guy that you liked playing for. I did. And he, motiv he was a great motivator. Bo was a scrappy player. You know, when I, when I signed in Philadelphia, you know, one of the things I think whenever you, whenever you go and play for someone or have the, you know, the opportunity to play for someone, you want that guy to be a manager and have coaches that are going to push you and try to help your game escalate to the next level. I think being around Bo, he was a, and he is, a wonderful baseball man. He's a great baseball mind. And just him, him loving the game every day the way he did, I think rubbed off on us. And it truly, it helped, I think, those Phillies teams later on with Charlie, who, who eventually managed those teams as well, uh, right. kind of set the bar high for them how to win and be winners you know, and that, that, was, that was pretty cool. You know, even though I wasn't there, I had later went to Chicago, but watching them win a World Series, and we're all brothers. You know, whenever you're in a clubhouse with players, we're all, we all form this brotherhood, and, and, you know, that was great to see them win a World Series, and it, it goes the same for Bo. Bo taught a lot of those guys how to play the game, and then Charlie kind of fed off of that and took him and did what he did with them as well. Later in your career, you play for Ron Gardenhire in Minnesota, uh, another old school guy still managing today with the Detroit Tigers. Yeah. But Gardy was a guy that also seemed to connect with you. Baseball. Baseball first had a great way of getting you to relax. And uh, I was older. I was a veteran player when I went to Minnesota. And, and that group of guys, that, that team we had with Puto and Kadir and Morneau and, uh, and Delman Young and Maurer, I mean, we had a wonderful team. And, and really, when you look at the way the Twins have gone about things for many years, it's just, it's simple. It's play the game right, do your work, and, and get players that love to play the game and play it fundamentally correct. And I, I know Gardy had a big uh, – I think he was a big key to all of their runs there for many years. And I think he took over from Tom Kelly, who also did that there in the early 90s when we were with Cleveland and come in. We always had our hands full playing the Twins just because they, they knew how to play the game. Gardenhire is interesting. I remember him coming up as a young player with the Mets. Uh, he was this fresh-faced, blonde-haired kid, uh, you know, kind of looked like a laid-back guy. But as a, as a manager, I mean, he's a little gruff, but he's very serious, very hard-nosed, kind of belies that early appearance. You, you can bet that if there was a close call at first base, he was going to get thrown out. He, he, would, he would come out and argue and get thrown out and motivate us and fire us up. Uh, and I agree. You know, he's a wonderful baseball guy. There's a reason he's been in the game for as long as he has. You know, and he's, he's, you know, he's right there for me on the top of the list. With all these other guys, I feel blessed to be able to have played for, and they're all unique and special in many, many ways. It's, it, it really, really was exciting now to look back at this list and go, gosh, you couldn't have scripted a bunch of managers you would love to have played for. It just was mm. so special. Played for Garden Hire in Minnesota. And when you're in Minnesota, you have to hear a lot about this man. Oh, I love him. Harmon Killebrew. And it's interesting because 
during your career, there were these comparisons between you and Killebrew. People would call you a left-handed version of Killebrew. Both of you came up as third baseman, eventually moved across the diamond to first base. Both of you had enormous power. Both of you, very patient, regularly drew over 100 walks a season. I mean, in some ways, you're a left-handed carbon copy of Harmon Killebrew. And I understand that you did get a chance to meet him at least on one occasion. Tell us about that encounter. Well, it was actually a, a more than one. And just first of all, thank you. I mean, any time, any time anyone is compared to Harmon, you know, is such a huge compliment. And getting an opportunity to meet him, you know, the few years I was there and when he was around, he just – man, he would walk into a room and just, you felt this, this true kind love, you genuinely rooted for you, would sit at the table in the lunchroom, whether you had 20 years or whether you had 10 days, and he would sit there and have great conversation. And he was just an absolute giving me chills thinking about it, because I, I, I wish well, now being blessed to go into the Hall of Fame, I, I only wish that Harmon would still be around to share mm -hmm. those early morning coffees at Otisago on the porch and then the dinners. And he was just truly, I've got to tell you, I mean, I've met a lot of great men in the game. Harmon, Harmon to me might be one of the greatest men that's ever been around the game. And I, I don't think anybody, you can't, you, nobody should ever be compared to Harmon because he was in such a unique class by himself of the way he treated players and people. And, you know, it's, I just feel very honored that I, that I had the opportunity to meet him and that we, we, we were able to interact. But you know, your personality is also very similar. He never was thrown out of a game never ejected by an umpire during a major league game, considered one of the nicest guys in the game. I know a few years ago there was a poll done of active major leaguers. So you were still playing at the time, and I think you finished second in the poll. I'm not sure who possibly could have finished ahead of you as the nicest guy. So your personalities, you're both easygoing, get along with everybody. So that's the other comparison, and, and I think it's a very accurate one. Well, thank you. I, again, I take that as a big compliment. And again, I just, I loved Harmon. I, you know, I, his family's great. You know, his legacy will forever live in Minnesota. And, and again, I, I, I mean, if you, if you asked every player that had the opportunity to meet him, they would just go on and on about just what a wonderful man he was. So thank you. I really appreciate that. And I, I consider that a big compliment. Thank you. Sure. Well, he treated us very well in Cooperstown as well. He was always great to the staff. I want to ask you one more question about him. He took special pride in signing his autograph very legibly, very clearly. Did you ever get an autograph from him? I do. I do. I actually have a picture here in my office it's behind where we're talking. Uh, and Harmon actually signed it to me like my first or second year when I, yeah, I think it was after my first year. So I actually did. I, I got an autograph from him and, and his penmanship is just absolutely amazing. Kadir, I, I've got to tell you, Kadir tells great stories. I don't know if you guys have ever seen Michael's autograph, but mm. it's, it's a great story on Harmon and how Harmon kind of had a conversation with him about signing an autograph meet where people can read it. And, but both of those guys, I think autographs are probably the best two that's ever been in the game. They're just beautiful, clean. Yeah. And, and, and that's what great leaders do. They pass that information down and, and then a great, you know, great guy like Kadir runs with it and uses that to, to, to maybe a special thing him and, him and Harmon shared. I've heard he did that a few times with uh, contemporary ball players. Yeah. He very nicely took them aside and said, hey, you need to take more pride so that when somebody looks at that autograph in five years, 
uh, they knew who it, uh, it came from. He had a long name, too, but you could read every letter on every one. No doubt. Let's talk about one of the great milestones in your career, and it's part of the Hall of Fame. Uh, this is something that you donated, your 500th home run ball. The game was September 16th, 2007. As I recall, it was against the Angels. Tell us what you remember about that game. Uh, it was a walk-off. It was in Chicago. We were getting ready to go on the road. Andrea, my wife, was pregnant with Landon, mm. and uh, we were getting ready to travel. I had an opportunity that weekend to do it from Friday to Sunday. Never did it. You know, lots of prep. I remember going through that. You know, they're, they're changing out the balls. You've got people, the fa- you've got the great fans getting on their feet, standing up, giving you a standing ovation. And let's face it, hitting a home run is one of the hardest things to do in sports and square a ball up and hit it far and hit it over the fence. So, you know, there, there was the anxiety the first couple days. And then after the first two days, that Sunday day game, it, it, it was in inter- the game kind of slowed down. It slowed down. As my at bats were going on that day, I felt a little more in sync. And then obviously in the ninth inning, uh, I got a sinker out over the plate and was fortunate. I hit it kind of a little bit left of center. And to be able to do it at home where I grew up in, you know, in Illinois and had family and many, many friends that, that came that day. It was so cool to do it before we went on the road. I just a special day for sure. There were I've been I was fortunate to have a few of those special days, and that stands out as as definitely one of them. I want to talk about the great story of you donating this along with your father, a very memorable trek to Cooperstown. I have to ask you though about the handwritten T, which you see above the Major League Baseball logo. Is that for Tommy or is that for something else? I don't know. That's a great question. I don't know. I I So you didn't write that. I didn't write that. No, 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 I don't know. That's a great, I guess we need to find that out. Yeah. Was it hard getting the ball back from the fan? No, no. The fan was great. Uh, You know, we, we had an opportunity to see, he was a true gentleman. He actually flew in from Chicago. I do believe he was actually in Chicago from Dallas, bought a ticket, sat out in left center, caught the ball, and what a what a nice what a really nice gentleman he was, uh, you know. And that and that I got to tell you, Bruce. So so getting an opportunity to to meet people as this process and the fans from different parks. I remember tying Mantle, I think it was in Fenway, and getting an opportunity to interact, give them a signed bat or a baseball or. Whatever, whatever, really, they kind of wanted. We, the interaction between the fans as this whole journey went on, process was so much fun, and mm-hmm. and it, it shows you kind of how cool that interaction is between players and fans. So you hit the home run, number five hundred, September of two thousand seven. But it does take a while before you're able to get it to the Hall of Fame. You don't put it in the mail. You don't FedEx it. You and your father hand deliver it, I, I believe, the following year, if I'm not mistaken. Tell us about why you wanted to make this trek in that way. Well, I mean, the ball needed to go to Cooperstown. That's where it belongs. Uh, it was, you know, that's where all the great memories, all the great things in baseball are. And now being a part of that is – yeah, it was just for me. I wanted to share that with my father and go. And the Hall of Fame did a wonderful job. We, one of the coolest moments is we sat out, had lunch at the Otisaga, overlooked the lake. And I'll never, you know, dad unfortunately passed away a year ago. And now looking back, he, you know, he, well, he got the opportunity to see so many great things and, now being a father, I kind of understand what all those things he loved and the baseball kind of journey that we went through together. But that that special time in Cooperstown stood out more than any because we were together one-on-one. And, and then when I hit number 600, 
I, I land them. My son, I had him deliver number 600. So then there was that bond and great special day we had together to share that as well. So very, very cool moment, very special. And both, both I'll never forget for sure. Now, Jim, with a 500 home run ball, that was a long trip. Wasn't it like 12, 14 hours in the car? And it's during the season. Uh, no, right? we flew in that. We had, oh, an off day. In. Okay. we had an off day in Baltimore. We actually got snowed out. We were going to bring the ball the winter. Well, during the winter that year, we got snowed out. Okay. And, and then we looked, on the, we looked on the schedule. We were going to have a – yeah, we had an off day – in or from Baltimore, I think going to Boston, and we flew. We both flew, and you know, and went in and shared that special day. And again, I always thank Chesta and everyone from the Hall of Fame. They, they, uh, just that whole group really knows how to roll out the red carpet and do it right for sure. So this was really your first full-fledged visit to Cooperstown. You had been here a couple of times before to play in exhibition games at Doubleday Field, but that's a, a very hurried schedule. There's yeah. not much of an opportunity to see the town, maybe a quick tour of the museum. You're at the ballpark, and then you know, you're on to your next city because it's right in the middle of the season when the Hall of Fame game was played. But the, the trip in, in 08, that was really the first opportunity to take in some of these sites. Yeah, and, and, and understand the true meaning, getting an opportunity to go through the museum and see all the great, well, the Ruth memorabilia and the Lou Gehrig and DiMaggio and see the names, just the great names that everyone knows has been so special for many, many years. And to see that, man, and to love the games just – it's, it, 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 it's a feeling like no other. I, I tell everybody, if you get an opportunity, go spend a couple days in Cooperstown and give yourself the time to truly take it all in and see all these great just, mem um, just these items that baseball players used and bats of Ruth and, you know, just the hat and the glove of Lou Gehrig and, you know, Stan Musial, all the Hank Aaron stuff that's on display in the museum. Just, it, it, it truly is, if you love baseball, you need to go and really take some time and, and really do it right and spend two, three days. Jim, did you have a chance to go down and see the lake at all? Uh, I did, I did, yeah. So, so the last couple of years during induction, we've had that chance, obviously. But one of the one of our to-do lists. Well, unfortunately, this year, Dreams Park for my son got canceled for our 12U, my 12U baseball team here in Chicago, and we were going to go and spend about three, four days before his tournament started. Unfortunately, that got canceled with everything going on, but. We are thinking about going maybe later this summer and spending a little bit of time getting out on the water, you know, renting a boat and taking it all in. It's, it's an absolute gorgeous place in the summer. And it's truly, you know, when you, when, you're, when you fly into Albany or you can go into Syracuse, when you drive and you're driving back to Cooperstown and then you enter it, it's like out of a, it's like magic. It's like out of a storybook. It just appears and then you see nothing but baseball stores and, you know, there's restaurants and it's just a really cool spot in our country that I think everyone that loves our game needs to go see. During those earlier visits, you played in Doubleday Field. How'd you like that? It was very, I loved it. It was very short to right field and, uh, I would love to have hit there every day. But again, it, it, that, that, that unique kind of home feel of how they've, they've kept it very clean. They've, you know, it's got that old time brick and uh, the field is in great shape. It sits in a little neighborhood, kind of, kind of similar, I guess, to Wrigley Field, but much, much different in a lot of ways. But it's just got that down home feel and, 
the games that the, the exhibition games and the classic games that I've played there, it's just a fun, it's just a fun time to get out and, and watch the fans because everybody's happy. When you go to Cooperstown, everybody's smiling and having a good time. Well, if you do come back this summer, and we certainly hope you do, uh, you'll see some changes at Double Day Field. They've actually moved the Sandlot Kids statue closer to the ballpark. They've redone the parking lot. Uh, they've done some other work, although they're still working on the interior of the ballpark. Uh, but already some improvements, definitely. Oh, great. Can't wait to see it. Let's talk about this item, which I think is fascinating. Your jersey from home run number 604. And immediately somebody will say, 604? I mean, that's not a round number. I want, I want to see the jersey from number 600. But there's a special story here because this is the home run jersey, if you will. You hit a home run uh, September of 2011. It was Jim Tomey night. You had just recently been reacquired by the Indians. They had purchased your contract from the Twins. So you're back in town. You hit a home run. It was an important home run. Helped the Indians win the game. Uh, and it just happens to be on the night where the Indians are celebrating. You couldn't have worked out any better, I guess. No, it, it worked out great. What a, what a special moment to go back and, you know, and then have an opportunity to, uh, to play against the guys. You were those twins teams that I was with there for a couple years. And, you know, just that whole night getting a chance looking, you know, my family was there and the crowd, the Cleveland the fan base there has always been so great. And, and I, you know, it was just a special time, you know. I mean, those nights, I think, bring the best out of the player. And to get a chance to hit a home run for that crowd that night, which they were really excited and, and ready to go to do that, was, was fun. And I do believe that was off Pavano, correct? Yes. Yeah, that was off no. Carl Pavano, who – Became a real good friend of mine there in Minnesota. And, you know, I'm sure him and I will have to have a few laughs about that. We, we had a few when I seen him after. But it's just, it's, it was just such a, such a nice moment to go back and have that kind of a night, especially on that, on that honor for sure. Like so many of your historic home runs, it wasn't pulled. It was more or less straightaway center field. Seems like a lot of your home runs went to the left center field gap, straightaway center. You were not just strictly a pull hitter. Um, one of the things that I, uh, you know, uh, found interesting uh, was listening to the play-by-play -play by the Indians broadcaster, Tom Hamilton. He absolutely flipped out when you hit this game-time <laughs> home run. I imagine you've heard that? Oh, many times. I love Tom. <laughs> Tom? Tom's got one of the greatest voices in the game. And to listen to his home run calls, they're legendary in Ohio and, and throughout baseball. Because I don't know if there's a home run that he's not animated and so fired up and pumped up to talk about. You know, it, I love Tom. Tom and I are great friends, have always been. And, and to listen, to go back to some of his calls are just great. Jim, was it a little bit strange going back to the Indians, the franchise for which you're best known as a player? Some of the players had changed. Some of the coaches had changed by then. Was it a little bit weird to be rejoining your well, old organization? I, I don't know if weird. It's just, you know, when you go back after you've spent a long time in one place, you know, there's always this sense of you want everything to kind of go right. You know, you want it to – you know, you just want to fit in. You want to be a part of what they've now built and become. And I remember for years, you know, when I was there, we would have guys that would come in. And one thing about the Cleveland organization, I can say this, and the fans, but the organization has always treated their players with respect. They've got a great farm system. They really – they really go out of their way to make players comfortable, and they did that. So to me, it was almost, yes, I had been gone for a while, but they made it very comfortable for me and, our, and my family to come back and fit right in. And same with the fan base. You know, they, they're very passionate. They love their players. And <clears throat> when, you're, when you're competing for them, they, they adore their guys, and they always did for many years. It was a great – it was the greatest place I could have ever come up 
in an organization and been a part of and played for. So I, I feel very lucky there. Here's another artifact from another very important <laughs> night. 2014, uh, the Indians decide to honor you with um, uh, the announcement of a building of a statue. Uh, you donated, or uh, maybe it wasn't you, maybe it was somebody from the Indians, but someone donated the program from that night. This is the second Jim Tomey night, the unveiling ceremony actually for the statue. Um, tell us about what that was like uh, to see yourself immortalized in bronze, an eight-foot statue. Uh, was it was it uh, intimidating in a way? Was it humbling? Maybe a combination there, of the two things. Humbling is the right word. I mean, you know, when you think about it, there were so many guys on our '90s teams that honestly could have gotten that honor to get a statue. We had so many great players, so many guys, wonderful guys that that were just, whether a Hall of Fame player or just gave so much, you know, during that time. And to, to have that opportunity from the organization to do that and humbling is definitely the right word. It definitely – it was kind of a surreal thing when they unveil it and you get to see, so you don't ever play the game to say, I want a statue or I'm going to get a statue. And when you get that, you look back at the time put in, you just feel it, it, it's, it, it's something that I'll never forget. I, I, I truly, it, it definitely made all of our family feel so great and, and understand that you don't, you're not up there alone. You know, there's so many guys, teammates, managers, coaches that played such a big part of why they unveil that statue. It's the players, it's your obligation to understand that and, and tell all of them, thank you. You were a part of this. We don't, it's not a thing that's alone. We did this together. And I feel so, so honored that they did that. Well, the statue is obviously in Cleveland. We're fortunate, though, at the Hall of Fame to have this artifact. This is a miniature replica, uh, and it captures one of your trademark mannerisms, the pointing of the bat towards center field. Now, for those who haven't followed your career, this is not you calling your shot. This no. was a mechanism that I guess you developed early in your career and something that, that helped you. How did this all begin? So I was in the minor leagues. You know, was was getting hits, and this goes back to Charlie Manuel. This is what a good hitting instructor he was. So he called me in one day, and you know, the movie, the movie, The Natural was on. So you know, he we needed to get some type of a timing mechanism. What I was doing was pretty much just standing in the batter's box from a standstill, and then going to hit, and I would lunge. I would be late. I just could not find my timing. So mm. when, when Charlie, I think we went out to batting practice, and he said to me, he goes, just, just try to kind of point the bat and then bring it back as the pitcher moves. And, man, it, it, it kind of cleaned up my rhythm, got me more fluid, got me in a, in a great position to have good at bats. And, and then from that day forward, you know, the one thing I never wanted to do was make it look like, hey, I'm pointing the bat right at the pitcher. You know, I, I so I would hold it a little bit off to the side, yeah. and it became my trademark. It became my my loading mechanism to get me ready to hit, and I'll never forget it. You know, when, when we started that, you know, it might have – I think we went out – it was either that night or the second night, and I hit a couple home runs – and then you go through this roller coaster where it kind of comes and goes, but it, it definitely helped clean me up from a from just a moving stand, you know, moving to get to my load to then become maybe a great hitter, which I that's that's how great Charlie was. I think Charlie Manuel did the same thing to Ryan Howard in mm. Philadelphia, and it really helped him as well. And sounds like there was not much of an adjustment. You took to this right away. I did. I did because I was a young player. That, that was one thing I think 
that I always was happy that I was a coachable kid. When, when if Charlie told me to try something, I would try it because I never wanted to walk away from a situation and, and understand or go, I never tried that to get better. And, you know, I was, I was lucky, you know, that we, over the years, we tweaked on a few things in my hitting and they, they, they fortunately panned out and worked out well. And it, 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 you look back at that and you, you know, having young kids that I try to help today, you know, like I think they have to understand that during the course of how you evolve, you're going to have to make some changes that, that makes you a better player. Mm. We're continuing our conversation, Ooh. virtual legends of the game with Hall of Famer Jim Tomey. It's time now to incorporate some of your questions. You can do that by going into the Zoom group chat box, typing your question, and uh, we'll do our best to have t uh, Jim uh, uh, answer the question for you. We did receive some questions prior to the program, so we want to include those as well. Uh, Jim, this first one comes from Captain Kyle Lease. He is with the Office of Naval Intelligence. He wants to know what kept you going through injuries, pain, the drudgery of the long 162-game season. What kept you motivated? I'm sure there were times when you might have been ready to just stop playing. Well, the love of the game always motivated me. I think, you know, I, I think learning the routine of what it takes to become an everyday major league player, like understanding, it. you know, when you're young, you're healthy, your body's in great shape, you know, you're obviously you're, you're getting yourself ready every off season to put yourself in that position of the grind, but learning as I evolved, learning, you know, how to eat correctly, you know, like learning how to condition, learning when to back off, learning when to go into the training room and get the right treatment. I was always, I was always had, or excuse me, I always had history of a back, low back, uh, some issues that I dealt with. So I had to always maintain my core work and my strength work that would ultimately help my swing and it for me to be able to play as long as I did I needed to do that you know four to five days a week to maintain that and I learned I learned a routine mm. but ultimately I never stopped loving the game you know even even at 42 or 41 or 42 when I retired I I felt like you know, I still, I, I had always loved the game and I always wanted to treat it, you know, every year, even though my role changed with pride and that I wanted to go out and help us win. We have a question in the chat room from Heather Benjamin, pretty straightforward. What do you consider your greatest accomplishment as a ball player? Oh, I, I boy. I would just say playing, getting an opportunity to play for a long time. And, you know, like, I think the individual things you do, like, if you have the opportunity to play a long time and your, 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 you know, like longevity, I think is big. You still have to go out and do it. You have to produce, but probably, probably, all those great runs in Cleveland as well, going to the playoffs. We went to a couple World Series. You know, those accomplishments, I think we did together. And look, look, look the 500, the 600 homers was great. It was great. That, that took a long, long time to accomplish that. But what we did together as teammates and winning those division titles in Cleveland and going to those two World mm -hmm. Series and you know, and being close to winning it all, that that journey, that grind to get there as a team was probably one of the better even though we didn't win, that 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 grind together was a great accomplishment that we all were in it together as one. You know, in a sport where the average career is about three point six years, to play twenty two seasons, that is an accomplishment in and of itself. Yeah, yeah, it's 
it takes a, it takes a lot of preparation. It takes a lot of discipline. It takes, it just takes a lot of learning as you go on learning yourself, knowing thyself and what makes you go. My workout or my training or the, my eating habits might be different than, than someone else's as I was playing. And I, you know, you, you got to learn, you know, like the grind, the dog days of August. I, I, over the years, I learned how to, you know, how to take care of yourself in July and August to finish up season strong and then carry that into the postseason. So it's, it's all a learning curve, but it is, you're, you're, you're really, and I tell young guys this, you're educating yourself every year on what you need, not what another guy is doing, but what mm -hmm. you need and what you need to do. Question from Jim Goble. He wants to know, how many of your home run balls approximately do you have in your collection? I, you know, I need to look through them. I have them stored. I have them put away. Uh, I don't display them. I have them all kind of in a, in a safe place. And one day I'll go through them. You know, they're going to go to my kids. So, you know, to me, I need it. That's a great question. I've got, I've got several, you know, I've got a few that, that and and what was cool and I said this earlier in the segment was was the meat you know, so it, I always liked to get the baseballs that I tied somebody meaning McCovey Mantle because the history of the game you know it was like oh man you tied Mickey Mantle or you tied Eddie Murray or Mike Schmidt like those are iconic names in the game that then those baseballs should go to my kids and their family and, you know, and or the Hall of Fame. So it's one day, one day, I'll probably sit around and, and go through them and kind of kind of reminisce and smile about that, that experience. Really good question here from Alex Karen. When you first got inducted, Jim, into the Hall of Fame, which Hall of Famer were you most excited to meet? 100% Hank Aaron. I mean, <laughs> Hank Aaron is, he's the guy, man. He was so, I was, I mean, to meet Hank Aaron and, and just, I mean, what you, we talk about Killebrew being a gentleman. Oh my gosh. Is, is Hank Aaron not the nicest gentleman you will ever meet? And, and he hit a lot of home runs and, to meet him, I got the opportunity, you know, from the Hall of Fame. They asked me to escort Hank to his seat. Mm. And I've got to tell you, that was one of the best moments of anything in my career that I've ever done. To sit and walk and, 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 and get the honor to walk Hank Aaron to his chair at the front of the, at the, front of the podium there, it, it, it just, I'll never forget it. It was one of the highlights that I've ever had in the game. I can confirm this because last year, you probably won't remember this, but we're backstage before the ceremony is about to begin. Uh, I strike up a bit of a conversation with you. So we're talking for a few minutes. And then you said, uh, I wasn't sure if you said it to me or, or uh, one of the Hall of Famers, uh, where's Hank Aaron? I got to find him. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. And and the thing is, when you're told to escort Hank, you go find Hank. You go, yeah. you make sure you're around because when you're called upon to, to walk him out, it was, man, it was just so special. I, I've got a picture that, you know, that, sh that, that has me walking him to, the, to a seat. And I, mm. it's one of my most favorite pictures ever. Nice. We'll do a couple more questions. Uh, here's a nice one from eight-year-old Gunnar Nelson. My dream is to get drafted to play professional ball. Can you describe how you felt when you were first drafted? Similar to, similar to when you get called to the big leagues. You know, as a young kid, you dream of playing Major League Baseball or getting an opportunity to sign with a team with the chance to play Major League Baseball and yeah, my, my thing is, is dream big, stay focused, understand it's a journey. There's going to be good days. There's going to be bad. Those bad days don't determine what type of a player you are. And, 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 you know, and I'm sure he does 
listen to your parents, have great parents that, that care about you and love you and, and communicate well with them and just enjoy the, enjoy the ride. You know, it's, I always tell kids from their freshman to junior year or senior year in high school and then the college kids, you know, every, every day is, a, is, a, is, is another day for you getting to your goals and reaching those goals. So stay focused, you know, still be a kid, enjoy the things you like to do, but there also is a big commitment in accomplishing those dreams. Final question from one of our viewers. Who is the toughest pitcher you faced and how'd you end up doing against them? Well, the toughest ever was Randy Johnson. Mm. Uh, I think that's a no brainer. And later on, I got a home run. I hit a home run on him in Arizona. Uh, but early on, I did not play much. I was a candidate as a young 22, 23 year old player in Cleveland that you know a right-hander was probably well, which was called upon to take at bats against Randy the other the other guy for me that you know that that gave me a lot of trouble was Jesse Orozco you know mm -hmm. I never felt comfortable and I don't know even my stats on him but I know for me when I dug in the box Jesse Orozco was a guy left-handed reliever they would bring in late in the game to get that big out against mm -hmm. left-handed hitters. And he was really good. I remember you had your hands full with Jesse. Through kind of three quarters, had that great slide. Yeah. Hard to follow. Absolutely. Yeah. Final question for me, Jim, as we get set to wrap it up. I want to talk a little bit about what you're doing now. Uh, yeah. You do some broadcasting for MLB Network, but more of a full-time job for you is working in the front office of the Chicago White Sox. Tell us about both of those. Love them both. Love them. I feel very blessed that when I retired, I got the opportunity right away to come aboard. I live in Chicago. So Jerry, Mr. Reinsdorf, and Rick Hahn and Kenny Williams called me in. Buddy Bell as well. Buddy played a big mm -hmm. role in that and, you know, wanted me to be a part of what they were trying to do. You know, I – I didn't know if I wanted to get back in the game after playing so long. And they've, they've been gentlemen. They've been great to a sense of they've let me be around my kids being retired. And they've also been understanding to that regard. And also I've, I've truly enjoyed going out and watching kids in the minor leagues, maybe trying to help a hitter find something that gets him going or sitting around the draft room, you know, breaking down someone we, we may take a pick on high uh, or a pitcher, same thing, maybe seeing little things. So that, I love, love my White Sox job. The, the MLB network as well, it's truly, since I've retired, it's like another form of teammates. All those guys, think about it. We've played against some with, and and it's a group of guys that genuinely root for you and want you to do well, whether it's Al Leiter, Harold Reynolds, Sean Casey, Billy Ripken, you know, they Carlos Pena, they all bring something special that they learn from the game. And now using the platform of the network, you know, trying to teach the greatest gift about the network job for me is when I walk through an airport and a father or son will come up to me and say, you know, Mr. Tomey, I, I did that hitting drill and it worked and I, I can't thank you enough. You, you know, you helped me. I mean, there is no better feeling ever than to have a kid or a dad come up to you and say that you've helped their kids. That's, that's yeah. such a, such a great gift. And, they're, and they're, they're wonderful people. It's a great environment to work for. And I, I've, I'm very lucky to have both of those jobs. Well, Jim, it's been a real pleasure to have you with us over this past hour. Uh, to have a chance to talk to the, uh, the modern day Harmon Killebrew has been uh, a lot of fun. Uh, really enjoyed it. We do thank you for giving us your time over these last 60 minutes and taking questions from the audience. And I hope we'll get you busier on MLB Network, uh, if you know what I mean. 
Thank you. I hope baseball returns soon so we can see our great game back out there for sure. Again, our guest over this past hour, Hall of Famer Jim Tomey, class of 2016. Uh, actually, 2018. Let me correct that. Very glad that Jim could be with us. And a reminder that coming up next Tuesday, we'll have another great Hall of Fame guest. We'll talk to the uh, Hall of Fame manager, also was a great player, Joe Torrey. That'll be 11 a.m. coming up next Tuesday. We thank everybody for joining us for Virtual Legends of the Game. We hope you had a good time with it. Have a great day, everybody.